Yes, hello and welcome. It's another Confessions podcast, all ready to go with some more terrible tales from the increasingly sinful and creative Radio 2 listener. Uh, Needing forgiveness from the Caring Collective and also from you, dear listener. This week's concise collection includes a T.A. toddler tease, a potty pottery prank, a saucy sisterly stitch-up and some frisky football frolics. That one all started on this podcast. Anyway, let's see what you make of these. Now, uh, tonight's confession, uh, it's signed, Someone from the Blog. That's how it's signed. So let's just say it's from a blogger. That seems to be relatively straightforward. Okay. Simon and the All Forgiving Collective. The confession I need forgiveness for takes me back ten years. I have three children, and at the time of this confession, Thomas, David and Louise all attended the same primary school. The school run required a four-mile journey, as is the way in my part of deepest, darkest rural England. As I accounted for a large percentage of the school's pupils, I was asked to join the Parent Teacher Association. I say asked, it was, you know, refusal, yeah. not an option. You're on, yeah. As I used a PC, I was quickly deemed the IT expert by the school. My reputation was cemented when one day someone discovered I had a CD rewriter. Protestations that it came with the computer and I didn't really know how to use it were brushed aside and I was hastily given all the PTAs and the school's media roles to complete. On one such occasion, the task was to burn onto the CD the recording of the previous week's assembly. You know, the kind of thing, stories read out, uh, some recorder and viola musicianship, someone asking to go to the toilet, that kind of thing. (laughs) This I did diligently and precisely and even added a slideshow of the pictures taken at the event to run as the music played. That should keep things quiet for a while, I thought to myself. I asked my wife to drop off the CD at the end of the school day and I briefed her that she needed to be in and out very quickly. Any loitering would result in being given other tasks. When inquiring later in the evening if she'd successfully completed her mission, my wife confirmed it was dropped off and she'd turned and fled at the sight of the headmaster approaching, uh, whisked up some kids from uh, her kids, uh, our kids from the gate and sped off home. Just pick up yeah, random yeah. kids, oh, yeah, yeah, just yeah. picked up our just kids so who we're calling Thomas, David and, and Louise. Louise. Now the next day I was on the school run again. Bags, lunch boxes, brushes, water bottles all thrown into the car with gusto and crammed somewhere in between a cello and a science project, my three children. Now, no journey is ever quiet and nor does any parent expect it to be, but there are moments when even the noisiest of cars needs to be firmly shushed for the driver's benefit. One such occasion for me on these school runs was Sir Terry Wogan telling the delightful tales of simple folk, the Janet and John stories. You remember those days? I do remember them quite well, yes. Those that remember the content of these family fables will recall that, thankfully, Satel would give a five-minute warning for he read them, uh, before he read them, as on occasion it may cause the odd sandwich to be dropped or tea to come shooting down one's nose. <laughs> also, in some people's... Just to All make right. sure that the kids <laughs> yes. are, not, are not out listening. of the car. Yes. I asked the kids nicely if they could try and just please be a little bit quieter. Shh. So Dad could listen to the story on the radio, but my appeals were rejected. In fact, it was having the opposite effect. The disturbed Dad listening to Sateri game ratcheted up to fever pitch and was being played, I must say, with some vigour. Tickles and pinches and raspberries, all these noises, all this bad behaviour was happening, nothing was out of bounds. What was I to do? And then I muttered those immortal words in the style of John Cleese thrashing his car with part of a tree. Right, that's it! (laughs) You've left me no choice! God, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes. It is, uh, amazing. I then continued. Oh. I am going to have to record your behaviour and send it to the headmistress. Instant silence in the car. I could already sense Thomas wondering, how are you going to do that then, smarty pants? It was a valid question, and there was the answer right in front of me. On the radio in front of me, there was a button marked T-A. It had never been touched, never used, knowingly. It was just one of those mystery buttons that turns up on car radios. Even the car manufacturer probably didn't know what to do with it. Well, now I did. Right then, I said, I'm engaging the teacher alert button. (laughs) It will send a recording of your behaviour, including taking pictures with the secret cameras, straight to your headmistress. The silence continued for maybe one or two seconds. And then roaring laughter, and it all carried on again. You're talking rubbish, Dad. Well, we'll see, I retorted. Well, Terry was not heard, not in his usual clarity anyway. I picked out some bits here and there. 
But I was grumbling, really. Something had to be done about my pesky kids who just didn't believe that the car had a teacher alert button on the radio. As luck would have it, the head was greeting parents at the gate. And the conversation went something like this. Did you get the recording that I sent in? I said in a business-like fashion, making sure all three of my progeny could hear. Yes, thank you, comes the reply. I've listened to it and will make sure it's distributed to all the staff. Wow. Brilliant. She then added, which was fortuitous, yes. having the extra pictures really helps to show who was doing what. Well, that, as they say, was that the look on the children's faces at the thought of having all their teachers listening and seeing what was going on in the back of the car was enough to stop them in their tracks. They now believe me about the TA button and slowly they turned to look at me. I tried not to look smug. I failed. I told you so. I whispered to them. Next time, you'd better be better behaved. Meek little nods all round. There was no need to take this any further. I let them scurry off chins lodged against their chests for the first few steps, looking more than a little worried. Well, they saw their friends and more so their teachers. But from that point on, the school runs, or indeed any other car journeys, were a far more pleasant experience, and one which never got out of control ever again. If things got noisy, my hand only had to hover near the TA button... <laughs> and everything fell silent. When I look back to how my deception resulted in many, many beautiful, peaceful car journeys <laughs> and how I was able to listen to Sir Terry recount tales, innocent tales, surely, of Janet and John in full stereo sound, I cannot ask for forgiveness, for I regret nothing. I do sometimes think of the local BBC travel presenters whose skills were shunned by the actions of a parent <laughs> wanting to control some rowdy children. However, it is the future for which I really need the collective's conscience. Thomas turns 17 in the forthcoming months, and there is talk of him purchasing a car. Uh. Up till now, I have resisted the urge to remind him that he needs to make sure that the TA button is disconnected. You see, he still doesn't know <laughs> that the whole thing was a joke. The thoughts of the car salesman's face and the embarrassment of my lad has already provided me with a <laughs> chuckle. Surely I'm fulfilling the role of the parent to embarrass your children at every possible moment, mm -hmm. to include, but not restricted to, recounting those stories in local drinking houses and wedding speeches. It's up to the collective, am I forgiven and should I tell him? So it's a double-hander, do you forgive him and should he tell his 17-year-old that you know that button, the TA button? <laughs> It's not a teacher alert button. Anyway, it's in the tradition of lying to your children. What do we have yeah. from Sister that's, Rebecca? That's a brilliant confession. That is just so resourceful of her to think of that. And also, teacher alert, yeah, yes. to, to coincide with the fact that she actually had done a recording. Just superb. I think, um, I think it's probably I find him, it, actually. Yes, he Sorry, did, him. You're absolutely right. I find it uh, a bit odd that Thomas, who's 17 years old, uh, doesn't realise that the technology to do that mm. may not have existed mm. 10 or so years ago. But, um... Anyway, <laughs> I think she should tell him because it will be very embarrassing at the car dealership uh, and just laugh it off. But I think it was a brilliant thing to do. I think and I've just called it a her, a her again, haven't I? So blogger dad, him, you are forgiven. Yes, you have called it a her. Sorry. And, and, um, <laughs> it's blogger dad. Very good. OK, so yes, he should say and yes, he's forgiven. Exactly. Basically. Deadly. Yes, I agree with that. I think he should be told, really. Yeah, poor Thomas, before he goes in, blundering his way through uh, purchasing a car. Uh, but yes, someone from the blog. Um, I've always wondered what the TA button did as well, to be honest. I never mess with these things. And it was very, very clever. It was very quick thinking when you got to the school itself. No harm was done. And you got to listen to a fabulous bit of Wake Up to Wogan, not to mention future editions. So well done you. Very clever. I wonder if there are any other Janet and John themed confessions and indeed whether I could read them out. Um, oh, yes. I'm not quite no. sure. Car radio, car radio and school run confessions. Well, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> His brother Matthew. And I, he was particularly <laughs> lucky, wasn't he, that when the the um, head teacher was talking to him. He didn't say anything else that could have been no. misconstrued, well, really. Up, well, is it, yeah, exactly. He didn't say, I particularly enjoyed the recorder recital, which at which point, you know, kids would blown have were blown everything. I, I love the fact that there's a 17 year old who could be going in to buy a car and say, oh, and of course, the TA button that uh, informs. Uh, my local school of everything that's going on in my car. Could that that's be disconnected, please? Could, uh, can you just make sure that's this? What? Uh, I love that. So, uh, don't tell him. Don't tell him, because that will be hilarious. Uh, yes, definitely don't tell him. Uh, definitely forgiven. Well done. Let's say this is from, uh, from, from Biff, OK? Dear Father Simon, in the early 90s, I worked for a pottery... Although not the most challenging of employment, I enjoyed my position working in the decorating studio. My workstation looked out across a splendid valley and I spent my days decorating goldware and listening to Radio 1. 
you might remember working for the station it does feature later. The only blot on the landscape came in the form of our diminutive kiln man. Now, often I thought he resembled Roland Ratt, a famous personality of the time. He would swagger around our little studio with the air of a man who, if he had the sense, would not have been seen dead in skin-tight jeans and Doc Martin boots. So large were they, that when he stood sideways, you could almost be forgiven for thinking he was an oversized golf club. That was our kiln man. Now, all this could be forgiven. After all, his unfortunate appearance, lack of dress sense and overinflated self-esteem might not have been his fault. What he couldn't be forgiven for was his obvious delight in frightening his fellow female workers. Now, the driveway down to our pottery and shop was a sharp series of hairpin bends complemented by a gradient that gave the sensation you're about to fall off the face of the earth. On one memorable occasion, after a lunchtime farewell drink for a retiring workmate, a couple of colleagues and I foolishly accepted a lift back from the pub. Kiln Man drove a bottle green Cavalier SRI, and unbeknownst to us, was desperate to... It could be SR1. SRI. SRI? Thank you very much. And unbeknownst to us, was desperate to show off his self-styled rally skills. We left the car park in a squeal of smoke and rubber. All three of us sat in the back seat and braced ourselves for what felt like an imminent rendezvous with the big boss. No amount of hysterical screaming was going to stop Killman from showing his girls what he and his bottle-green SRI could do. I can only think that the mild sedative effects of white wine at lunchtime uh, got me through the whole experience. Well, this was mistake number one. Mistake number two came when Kiln Man discovered that I was an incurable arachnophobic of the particular jumpy and screamy type. Unfortunately, enormous black eight-legged fiends grew to a disproportionate size amongst the seldom disturbed confines of a warm pottery in the middle of fields, a fact also not lost on Kiln Man. After lunch became his favourite time to prowl. The effects of early morning starts and stodgy canteen offerings, coupled with a few slow songs on Steve Wright in the afternoon, meant that I had to fight to keep my eyes open. No offence, Steve says Biff. In my unsuspecting state, I was an easy target for Kiln Man. On finding an eight-legged spider, Kiln Man would creep into our studio. Over my shoulder, a cup would suddenly appear. Bam! Kiln Man would slam it down onto my workspace, inches from my body. I'm shuddering and trembling as I write this. And as my eyes locked onto the cup, I knew what was wriggling, ready to run out underneath it. And I knew Kiln Man was behind me, blocking my escape. I think he really enjoyed the dramatic pause, which is probably why I don't like X Factor or any other of those overproduced shows. On releasing, <laughs> on releasing a frightened beast of the spider variety, Kill Man would step aside, openly delighting in what was obviously a fantastic floor show and laughing uncontrollably at my hysteria. As the summer continued, you can imagine that this wore a little thin and then an opportunity presented itself for revenge. Kiln Man, looking for somewhere cool to store his lunchbox, asked if he could put it on the workspace alongside me. Hoping to keep him sweet, I agreed. Later that morning, listening to a certain Simon May reading at Confessions, I had what only can be described as a divine inspiration. Now, as far as I know, this is the first time doing a confession has inspired another Quite confession. Freaky. Very yes. meta, this, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. it is. As you may recall, my workstation looked out of a window. A window with a window ledge that was rarely cleaned and as such collected rather a lot of dead and assorted bugs. Kiln Man's lunchbox was right next to me. Oh, no. Well, I peeped inside. It was cheese and pickle sandwiches today. Incidentally, the king of all sandwiches, you have to say. Perfect. I told my fellow workmates what I was planning to do and as they kept watch, I peeled back the bread and started to add the odd soft-bodied accompaniment. Now, the huge advantage of pickle is, of course, its crunchy nature. Who was to know if you were biting down on a carrot, a radish, a cucumber, or, as in this case, a wood lice? Oh, what? Centipede or a slug. All was sealed back down and no one other than the three of us was any the wiser. Well, lunchtime and crunch time came. And firstly that day, Kill Man decided that despite his frequent attempts to torture me, we were all friends because I had looked after his lunchbox. <laughs> Steady. It's just as well we waited till Deadly wasn't there because he'd have done another Janet and John thing on us. Yeah, anyway, revenge could not have been sweeter as Kill Man set down his lunchbox and heartily started to eat his lunch. All three of us was tra- were transfixed. We dared not even breathe for fear of discovery. Our eyes never left his mouth, and what was going into it, goodness only knows what he must have thought. Bemused and a little flustered, he finished his sandwiches and left without a word. 
Father Simon and the Holy Collective, I fear I am beyond saving. I have since, inspired by you and that unholy experience, racked up many more confessions. In truth, I've waited 20 years to confess this one. So paranoid have I been that Kiln Man might find out where I live and post me back a little eight-legged treat. I hope you can find it in your hearts to forgive me. I'm truly sorry, even if I am smiling at the thought of Kill Man, listening in recognition, but not knowing if I'm writing about him. Well, I'd never thought of cheese and, uh, cheese and pickle as a dangerous sandwich, but in the hands of Biff, clearly this is something that has to be taken into consideration. Also, who'd have thought that just broadcasting these confessions might lead to other people committing sins? Anyway, let's see what Sister Rebecca well, thinks. Well, Kill Man sounds very strange he and does. a bit creepy, actually. Yes, and and that... uh, I, I just think the thing with the spiders and the cup and then standing behind Biff... Is Biff a man or a woman? We don't know, do we? No, we don't. Standing behind thing. Biff so Biff couldn't get away. I mean, that's just a the, h- horrible origi- thing to do. In the original story, Biff was a girl. OK. In the original books. But anyway, uh, Biff is... Uh, yes, uh, so I think the, it was a horrible thing the only to thing, do. Um, the only thing about it, I would say, I mean, what is the point of, uh, of getting revenge? on Kill Man if you didn't even know that he was having revenge uh, yes. meted out on yes. him. So I think they should have just told him that they'd fed him uh, these nasty things and it would have been a better punishment. But no, you're completely forgiven because he was horrible. I think there may well be mm. other uh, spider-based confessions. I think there might be quite a few. Also, if there are any other confessions which come from, indeed, hearing a confession, we'll take those. But anyway, what do you think, Brother Matthew? Uh Yes, Kill Man. Um, sounds like a pretty uh, pathetic superhero. It does. Watch as I... Slightly harden your pottery, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, here's the other thing: when Killman is is presenting this spider, Biff was asleep. So here's an idea, Biff: don't fall asleep at work. You're being paid by this pottery. <laughs> so what are you doing falling asleep? I don't care if it's warm. And also the idea that he's eating. We're all going to be eating insects soon, aren't we? Apparently, this isn't the first confession we? we've. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, the waters rise. We're going to run out of forests. We're all going to end up eating bugs. So, uh, so it's coming to the best of us. So for that, I am uh, not going to forgive because I, uh, yeah, because I've got a problem with uh, Biff falling asleep <laughs> at work and expecting us to feel sorry for him. Well, Biff is uh, blaming it on Steve Wright playing some slow songs. Well, yeah. So here, here's an idea: go somewhere where you're not going to be too warm. <laughs> Are you excited, Alan, about the forthcoming oh, World Cup? Oh, so, so, yes, indeed, absolutely, because uh, I'm in a couple of sweepstakes, actually. Who have you got in your sweepstakes? I've got Iran in one of them, and I can't remember what the other one was. <laughs> you've got Mexico. So, why are you laughing? You've got Mexico and Iran. Mexico Did I say Iran, something amusing? You've got no hope. I've got Cameroon. Have you got I'm How not, do you know I'm not in Mexico? a sweepstake. Are you in the yeah, sweepstakes, cause, cause, No, 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 How I'm how not. How do you no. know I've got Mexico? And I know, because you've pinned it up on the wall. Oh, have I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. It won't be there long. Don't worry, it won't be there long. <laughs> Listen, the, conf- <laughs> the confession music is up and running. Stop this stupid football gossip. This is the voice of Sal- Sally. I'm channeling. Oh, right. You start. You. Susan has sent in tonight's tale. Susan, thank you very much indeed. Dear Father Simon and the Holy Collective, I'd like to take you back to Teesside in 1984. I was oh, a yes. six-year-old only child, and two life-changing events were about to happen. Firstly, I discovered pop music, in particular, Madonna. Like a Virgin had just been released and I had found my first pop idol, a star I would follow for years to come, whose music has since become the soundtrack to my life. This new exciting phase coincided with the birth of my longed-for little sister, Tori. Every Sunday I would sit attentively listening to the charts, hoping for a newly released Madonna song, fingers poised on the record button. Whatever you... Ask your grandparents. That's the way you used to do it. If you wanted to have a particular song, you have to record it off it the radio. It was always such bad quality. It was a little bit bad. <laughs> Hoping home home the DJ is killing music, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping desperately the DJ wouldn't talk over it. That's what we all do. Yeah. I'm I just... insisted Madonna was played at every available opportunity, much to the dismay of both my parents and anyone else within a 200-metre radius. Actually, it could be 200-mile radius. It's just an M. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Of my bedroom. <laughs> My little sister didn't stand a chance. She had to learn to love Madonna as I did, especially if she wanted to hang out with me and my cool friends. Oh, yeah. That's right. As time passed, the novelty of having a new sister, frankly, wore off. But my sister's love for Madonna grew stronger. My sister would try to suck up to me with Madonna's song lyrics she'd cut out of smash hits or watching Madonna tour videos with me or even trying to learn the dance routine to Vogue when I had no one else to hang out with. Anyway, we both dreamt of going to a real live Madonna concert, but it was Teesside. It's the early 90s. No bands came this far north. And even when the Telly West Arena was finally built, it wouldn't attract stars like Madonna, according to Susan. 
Time passed, I went off to university with my Immaculate Collection album, and after four years I came back home still dreaming of that unattainable concert ticket. My sister, of course, stayed faithful to Madonna during my years away, but in this time also built up her own dreams of holidays to Disney World, trips to Lightwater Valley, all of which seemed to be instantly fulfilled because it seemed she was, as Radiohead once said, so special, so very special. She got everything she wanted all the time. <laughs> Oh, then one morning, whilst driving to my graduate job as a credit control clerk in Middlesbrough, there was an announcement on the radio. Madonna was touring and would play two concerts at yeah. Earl's Court in London. Oh. I was by now a woman of limited but some disposable means. This was the chance I had been waiting for. Yes. I got to work and in a frenzy of excitement called my Madonna friend in crime, Anne, and we agreed to try and get tickets. As if God himself were shining down on me, I managed to procure two tickets at great expense for a concert bus trip, or a concert bus trip, for a concert and bus trip from Middlesbrough Station for me and Anne. I was beyond excited. I couldn't wait to get home and gloat about my good fortune. I made the Madonna announcement over dinner. My parents, get this, my parents decided the trip would be a great birthday present and offered to pay for my very expensive ticket. Wow! Life was getting better and better for me. But my sister was less excited by my apparent good fortune. What do you mean you're going to see Madonna? Did you get me a ticket? Well, so wrapped up was I in my own excitement, it didn't occur to me to buy a ticket for my younger sister, whose love of Madonna, as I've mentioned, caused in the main by me, was as great, if not greater, than mine. She was devastated, but my parents managed to placate her with the promise of tickets to see the Backstreet Boys or, s <laughs> or some other rubbish band, and all was forgotten. Until my Madonna pal in crime, Anne, got a new job in Leeds. She was moving away and didn't dare ask for the two days leave that was going to be required to travel to London for the concert. Suddenly, I had a spare ticket and a sister who was desperate to see Madonna. The way forward was clear. I had a ticket. I had a sister. Sister wanted ticket. Couldn't be simpler. However... My sister was younger than me and therefore very annoying. On top of this, she kept getting her own way, with every wish seemingly granted, and I found this extremely irritating. So I did what every elder sister would do in my position. I sold the ticket for a lot of money. No! <laughs> to a friend. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my sister was only 15 and didn't have the means to pay for the ticket herself, meaning my parents would have to stump up the cash, rendering my birthday present null and void. <laughs> Why should she have a present when it was my birthday? I was teaching her a valuable life lesson. Oh, that right. rings a bell, yes. Yeah, right. And so, says Susan, I ask for forgiveness, not from my sister, but from the family friend who bought the ticket and who is about to become my sister's sister-in-law. To this day, wow. she has no idea of how desperately my sister wanted her ticket and the part that she played in a sibling feud that has simmered for over 15 years and which might have just kicked off again. No one knew until this time. No. She had the ticket, she had the ticket. It could have gone to her darling sister, but no, the profit motive was there and she flogged it for a great price to a family friend. It was also the hatred of her sister. <clears throat> that was the motive, wasn't it? I don't think Although, it not the hatred. Little no, but the, the, well, the, I think the line not was, wanting the my sister. sister was younger, therefore very annoying. Exactly, that's why she didn't give her the ticket. <laughs> Nothing to do with the, that was the, the money line. from the friend. But anyway, so she wants the friend's forgiveness, does she? Yes. I, I mean, I don't think the friend um, needs... To be I too bothered. I, well, yeah, she, she got paid the ticket. a lot of money. Well, she got to go to the concert as well. I mean, I think the sister does need her forgiveness. Yes. Uh, she needs her sister's forgiveness uh, because I do, I do think it's quite mean. I mean, annoying as she is, it, she is her sister and she did introduce her to Madonna. So I think. Uh, what, I, would you, what would you have done? I would have given it to my sister. You said yeah. it. I'll tell you what I would have. No, no, I'll tell you what <laughs> rang a bell. The thing about the birthday present being nullified by the fact she would have got the ticket paid for her. But what they could have done is they could have given the big sister, they could have given Susan. Another present, isn't it? Boring? So, that have, so that would have. Does that make sense? They could have given yeah. her two birthday presents, and they could have paid for the ticket for the. It's having to be fair sister. to all your kids. It's just exactly. It's anyway, tiring. so for that reason, I am not forgiving you. Uh, okay, he's deadly. Let's no, see what I, the dean I, makes of this. Well, I can't forgive either. I'm afraid my sister was younger, therefore very annoying. That's not the reason, is it, to do that to her? Really, I think the, t the ticket should have gone to the sister, I think it undoubtedly. Should. And I, I wouldn't involve the other person anyway. She paid money for that.
Uh, she paid a lot of money. A lot of money for uh, that. But Susan uh, would like forgiveness all round, really. Let's just think. Let's see what comes well, I wonder Well, I wonder if Matt has any forgiveness in him. Well, this, uh... here's the thing with younger siblings. You are all such a pain. We, were, <laughs> we came along first, yes. and then you turn up looking far cuter, and everyone gives you all the attention. No, it's no, not no, our fault. It's not our fault. Don't take I'm it out on us. Lucky because now it's... Why wasn't Tori picking up a phone and buying tickets? Because she gets everything handed on no a money. She, she, she can't afford she's it. The young, cute-looking one. Can't afford well, it. Unlucky this time. Didn't get to see Madonna. Turns out life doesn't revolve around you. I am definitely going to forgive. Well done, Susan. Life lesson there for Tory. Unlucky. So harsh. So harsh. <laughs> well, that's it. I, you know, there may well be Madonna-themed uh, confessions. I'm not sure how many we'd be able to broadcast. Uh, elder, si- but we know that there are many, many sibling oh, yes. confessions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elder sister, younger uh, brother, younger. All of, all Deserve the everything they get. I was yeah. the youngest. I was the youngest. Oh really? Yeah, Can look, you tell? Yeah, look what happened yeah. to you. Not bitter and twisted. At On all. a plate. So it's virtually twenty minutes to six o'clock, and this is Radio Two. And the thing about Nigel not making it uh, into the uh, confessional collective is that we don't have to eat his prawn. <laughs> I'll have all of it then. That's the way it goes. Oh, really? Yeah. Are you a top prawn fan? Yeah, a prawn and samphire fan. Let me just check. Let me just check. When <laughs> oh, here he that comes. flash of that yeah. flash of lightning? <laughs> yeah. It, the yeah, thing is, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's understandable because oh, this feature know. could it, it changes, doesn't it? It could, it could come at any time through the show. You never quite know what time the confession is going to be. So therefore, Nigel's lateness is excusable. <laughs> Hiya. Not. <laughs> I like the sunglasses. Oh, thank you. 20 minutes to six. Surprisingly, it's confession time. Oy. The novice makes it in. It means that we don't have to eat your prawns, then. So here we have We've got a World Cup confession. Brilliant. I'm not sure if I had a World Cup confession before, but if there are any like this, then we'll happily take them. Uh, let me just see who this comes from. It comes from the guilty one. That's what it's like. Dear Simon and the lovely, kind and late collective. <laughs> I was in extemporization there. I was in bed listening to your confessions. But first, there's an interesting image here right in the very first paragraph. I was in bed listening to your confessions podcast whilst also looking up the upcoming World Cup fixtures on the net. How rock and roll is that? <laughs> nice reference to On the Net there. How on very, the Net. Uh, how nice, very 90s. And a nice reference to the Confessions podcast, which is available this and every oh, Friday. Well anyway, my, my two senses collided, and I was reminded of a terrible crime committed by my younger self ten years ago. Obviously, your younger self's got nothing to do with your older self. I had just moved to a gorgeous spa town somewhere near the Midlands, and my... Not that many. Narrow that down a bit. And my future hubby worked away during the week leaving me free to live a carefree existence with no responsibilities, Monday to Friday. After the first few months of boredom, I soon filled my post-work mid-evening, mid-week evenings with a variety of amateur, all-the-gear-no-idea sporting activities. I played five-a-side football, round-robin squash, tennis Tuesday, easy cycling Wednesday, all followed by the obligatory trip to the pub or bar or club as befitting any single 25-year-old girl. Well, summer and Euro 24 came along, and uh, 2004 came along, and we were all infected with football fever. So me and my uh, new sporting... When I say World Cup uh, confession, it was was a a kind of an international football (laughs) loosely... Okay. We get it. Okay, It's fine. Okay, well, we're all infected with football fever, so me and my new sporting friends swapped our normal pub for the Barden Arms uh, with their big (laughs) screen telly. We just had to rename it, obviously, and it was the first name that... You call it yeah. King's Head. Unless there is a Barden There Arms. is a place called Barden, and uh, there hasn't Barden got a pub Arms? there. No, but there is a place called I don't Barden think there's Arms. Barden Arms, so we'll just... Yeah. Anyway, it's the pub. Mm. With their big screen telly and tempting buy two glasses, get the rest of a bottle of wine free offers, all that kind of thing. And so to the night of my crime, it's the 24th of June 2004, and the England versus Portugal quarter-final. I had cycled straight from work to my mixed five-a-side football game, then straight to the pub, just in time to see the start of the big match, but too late to secure our usual spot near the telly, as I'm only five foot nothing, and my lovely friend Jane only five foot three, so we struggle to actually see anything. On this occasion, we found our view obstructed, not by the usual rowdy bunch of footy fans, not a problem, but by the extremely overly loved-up smooching couple in front of us. Now, I am not a prude, and certainly not averse to a little drunken kissing, but this couple needed to get a room! 
To make it worse, they were both tall, towering over us little people and completely blocking our view of this vital football match. They ignored our polite request to move or sit down and he proceeded to go from vigorous snogging to then cheering at the football and then knocking us in the face with their large Duke of Edinburgh hitchhike across Europe style rucksack. Ugh. Irritating. Mm -hmm. We soon lost interest in the game, which we could neither see nor hear. We drank a little more and got increasingly frustrated by this thoughtless couple. At half time, the girl went off to the toilet and the man started rootling around in their vast rucksack, studiously ignoring our siren style pleading for him to move aside to no avail. The lady friend returned, football restarted, and we were none the wiser or any closer to seeing the TV. However, in his eagerness to get back on with the exploration of the interior of her mouth, the male one had slung his rucksack onto his back but left it wide open at the top. Tempting to even the most sober of interested football fans, but irresistible to two fairly woozy girls who completely lost interest in this most vital of matches. We spent a while thinking of what we could put, pour or tip into the open rucksack when suddenly inspiration struck me. A genuine eureka moment. As I mentioned earlier, my sporting prowess would be described as amateur at best, but I did always try to look the part. This meant I usually carried a small wardrobe of clothes in a small bag on my bike, obviously including spare underwear for post-sporting showers. I rootled around in my bag and located a pair of pants. As luck would have it, a reasonably sexy black tiny size 8 thong. Oh, hello. Well, we waited until they were both looking forward at the telly, and I slipped the clean knickers into the <laughs> rucksack. Crime committed? No going back. At full time, it was his turn to go to the loo and her turn for a rummage. It didn't take her long for my pants to be discovered. <laughs> it's a line I've never read out no. before in a confession. Wow. It didn't take long for my pants to be discovered and then held up for inspection. And then used in evidence in the What the hell are these? Because they're certainly not mine! section of the couple's conversation as the man made a puzzled return to his until just recently happy girlfriend but I don't seek forgiveness from this actual couple who proceeded to argue but then somehow snog all the way through the penalty shootout Ugh. I don't seek forgiveness from them even though we did try and follow them home to see what happened next as he tried to explain the presence of these strange knickers a question which still makes me ponder and gives me a little evil chuckle ten years later I do seek forgiveness though from the people who were stood behind us in the pub as we giggled and screeched ourselves stupid at our cleverness at such a brilliant revenge, therefore becoming what we detest and stopping them actually enjoying the England match even though we lost. I hope you're going to find uh, that you can forgive me and that this will serve as a cautionary tale for any new couples thinking of going to the pub to watch any football matches this year. Please can you forgive me so I can watch the World Cup with a clear conscience. Uh, kind regards, the guilty one. P.S. Please don't use my name, as I'm now a respectable mum and generally nice, even though my husband does say I have, a, have an inner core of evil. <laughs> Which is always an interesting thing to know. Thank you very much indeed, the guilty <clears throat> one. How annoying would that be with a couple of large rucksacked people snogging in front of you and you can't see the football? Yeah. Anyway, what do you the think, The rucksack's about enough, but really, what were they doing there? It sounds like they were completely uninterested and they should have been somewhere else. I mean, it's so selfish and being near the screen as well, blocking everyone else's view. Uh, I think the revenge that uh, the guilty one took was inspired. It was quite clever. Really, really clever. Um, I just hope it was worth it for her because she lost what sounded like quite a nice pair of pants, really. But anyway, they then... Bit, would, that be, would they be quite pricey? <laughs> I have no idea, but they... <laughs> They sound What do you think, quite Nigel? You nice. might know. Well, I think the box thong set probably isn't that expensive. So oh, okay. I think it was just. I just don't know worth... where they were from, though. Anyway. Well, uh, from her bag. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, they originally. They did, I don't know in you're fact, right. turn out to be a bit hip hypocritical, didn't they? Because they started just screaming with laughter afterwards, annoying everyone else. So that bit I can't really forgive. But apart from that, I do forgive you. Uh, what do we think with the novice here? It's not a youth club. That's what we used to shout. In, I remember as a young lad in, in uh, clubs, and everyone started like, doing things like that. So obviously they ignored all that banter. And I think because they were short of stature, the people behind them probably weren't that uh, too bothered because they couldn't see the screens because of the two big people with the rucksacks. So I think it was a very good wheeze uh, and well done, and uh, other people should be more considerate. So uh, thongs are us, and you're forgiven. Very good. Um, OK, let's see what uh, Brother um, this, uh, this confession touches on two of my prejudices. Is. One is the public <laughs> displays of affection, but oh, look at how much in love we are. We don't care. No one cares. And it happens at rock concerts and it happens at football matches and it happens in the pub. I don't care how much in love you are. Get a room, whatever. The other is rucksacks. Here are the rules. If you're wearing a rucksack over both of your shoulders, then you better be on a mountain. Because otherwise, I am going to be accidentally on purpose pushing into you at every available opportunity. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, I am definitely going to forgive because I'd have done five. Far, far worse.
I Any think thoughts he, on thongs? Uh, kissing no, confessions. Big fan of thongs. <laughs> big fan of you in thongs, Nigel. World Cup in public uh, confessions. We'll take those. They were this week's confessions. Hope you enjoyed them. Who did you forgive? And we need to know your own story, please. Your own mischievous misdeed. Maybe you get forgiveness, maybe you won't. You send it to confessions at bbc.co.uk. More in a week. And the weekly mayo available to download now and every Friday. Thank you.